My father died 20 years ago today. Had he lived, he would now be 100 years old. My father, Povilas Skarjus, was born in Varkuyu Kaimas, Varkuyu uh, farming district in Lithuania in 1912. He was born in this log cabin. Uh, to this day, the log cabin has dirt floors. The metal roof that you see uh, was only put on in 1967. Before that, it had a thatched roof, a grass roof. He was born of Kazmiera and Ioannis Skarjus. They had a farm that grew potatoes and cabbage and beets and, and grain. His father, uh, Ioannis, after whom I'm named, uh, would harvest the rye uh, by hand with a, a scythe he would have his sons back from college and the military and my father was always proud of the fact that it was my father or my grandfather his father who was able to cut the most rye his mother Kazmiera was supposedly a, a very kind wonderful person she had 14 children uh, six of whom died in in early years, and eight of whom survived. My father, Porvilus, was the oldest. He was born on August 11, 1912. Let's take a broader look at what was going on at that time in the world. This is a, a map of Europe from 1910, not long uh, before he was born. The large yellow country on the right is Russia. The Tsars uh, ruled Russia like kings, and it, it was a large empire. From 1795 to that time, uh, they also ruled Lithuania. Lithuania, if you can tell from this map, is smack in the center, the geographic center of Europe. Uh, and it was long uh, a part of Russia. And uh, back in 1832, there was an uprising that failed. Those who fought, lost, and survived hid in the hills. When they returned to the towns, they hid their identity and used an assumed name, Skurgis, meaning from the Skurgis. Scardis, which meant precipice or cliff or hill. And that's how we got our family name. Well, there was another uh, uprising in, in, the six, in the 1860s, and it also failed. And then there was the whole busy time around the, the First World War. Uh, Lithuania was, was uh, still part of, of Russia, technically, and then in Russia, there was a revolution that led to the communist uh, control of that country. And in 1918, this very brave group of men declared Lithuanian independence. Lithuania was its own country suddenly, although certainly there was a time to make that stick, to make it secure. Notice there was a one special fellow here that we're going to talk a lot more about, and he was Antana Smetona, who went on to be the first and last president of independent Lithuania between the world wars. Historians now call the 1918 to 1940 era the Smetona era, or the time of Smetona. Smetona made Lithuania the fastest growing economy in the world in the 1930s. World economic production grew over 2%, while Lithuanian production grew 172%. And one of Smetona's pet projects was to create a very large boom in the building of schools. Well, that's where Porvila Skarjus again uh, 
comes into our story and he went to school. He became the educated firstborn of the Scottish clan. And with that education, he went on to officer training school. Uh, he and other young men were very proud of independent Lithuania and wanted to be part of it, to protect it. He was very proud, even decades, many decades later, of the fact that in his training they had contests uh, for long hikes or runs <clears throat> with a 40 pound pack and he would come in first. So he was a strong, strapping uh, member of the army. He went to this officer training school that was like our West Point in the United States. Here's a, a picture in front of a, a building with a thatched roof like the one, like the roof on his home at that time his 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 home uh his place of birth so there he was a proud officer who rose to the position of lieutenant a proud officer in the Lithuanian military but what was even more special came after his training and he was assigned to the personal guard of the president of Lithuania, Antana Smetona. This was big stuff, an amazing opportunity for this young officer. And he became close friends with the president and the first lady. My father is on the right. There's the, the first lady there to, to the left of him in the picture and the president. She was a big ally. He had a, a great deal of interaction with her. They became friends in part because of a penchant for playing cards that they both had. So here's my father, Povela Skarajus, and he is risen in this wonderful growing country, independent country, to the highest levels here with the inner circle of the president and the president's wife. This was, these were special times for him. This was a heady, grand time for my father. Among many things, he developed a skill in photography. He had a good eye. He played sports. Here he is playing table tennis. He eventually taught me to play table tennis and I went on to to be able to be a decent player play in tournaments. Here he is playing tennis back then. Uh, he gave me a my first tennis racket and I went on to have a, a bit of a career in, in, in tennis. This was, I think, the heyday of my father. He was a rising star, a strong young man in the right place at the right time. He also had an aesthetic eye. He developed photography as a hobby. This was a, an award-winning photograph of his. And during that time he also somehow was able to uh, go to law school as well, I guess in some arrangement with the military. And he not only uh, studied law, but he studied all the classics of literature and he was so proud that he knew and studied the classics uh, 
He was particularly fond of the writings of Goethe. So, intellectual achievement, wonderful hobbies, an aesthetic eye, sports, and he rose to the high level of, of, of uh, that society with a close association to the president. I, he was on the way to be a lawyer and, and I believe likely would have uh, been a legislator at least in that, in that world of, of independent Lithuania. But then some fateful events occurred. In June of 1940, Soviet tanks came into Vilnius, uh, into Kaunas, into the uh, independent Lithuania and took over. My father uh, was really uh, implored to leave. He had to leave. He had to leave ahead of of the the Soviet troops, tens of thousands of those people associated with uh, government, uh, with uh, any level of the the ruling elite, were killed and sent to Siberia, and that's how it went. My father had to leave. He went underground. He worked as a runner, crossing the border by foot at night as a courier between those trying to organize a government in exile and those still in Lithuania. See, I never knew about that, though, because he never talked about it. I only found out from my uncles uh, about three years after my father passed away. So that was a, a tough time. And he was in and out of the country and in, in hiding, in underground. Then June of 1941 came. Germany, Nazi Germany, had declared war on uh, Russia and took over Lithuania. Now, here's a picture of, of them in the streets of Vilnius. Now, this, of course, was uh, disaster and extermination for 90% of the 400,000 Lithuanian Jews, but also of note, 70,000 ethnic Lithuanians were conscripted in the German army or sent to forced labor. But somehow, my father was able to get back in the country and resume uh, uh, his law school and also get a a part-time job in the train system. He survived. He's, he managed to be in his country. And in 1942, he married. In 1944, in January, uh, his, his wife, my mother, Ona, gave birth to my sister, Ina. But that was January, and then came... Not too long after that, June of 1944. What was happening is that the Nazi uh, German army was losing and the Soviet Union was advancing on German positions and it became clear that they were going to they were going to advance on Lithuania. Porvilas, my father, knew that would mean genocide for much of Lithuania, and it did. In fact, a third of all Lithuanians were killed by the Russians, or sent to Siberia, or had to flee their home country for good. And because of connections to the Smetona independent government, staying would mean my father's death. So he managed to get passage for his family, by train, through to the Austrian Alps near Switzerland. They traveled through bombing raids, just with what they could carry. Once there, 
they were homeless. I want to show you how much I believe this war on my father, just this period of time. I'm going to show you again the wedding picture of him in 1942. Nice, young, clean man. Now just take a look at his face two to three years later. I believe it represents a lot of adrenal stress and a lot of aging. When the war ended, uh, my parents, my sister and my grandmother went to the U.S. sector of Germany to a refugee camp. This meant relative security for a five-year wait to get to the U.S. Most of these were intellectual political refugees, what I like to call the best-dressed refugee camp I've ever heard of. And while not much was going on and there wasn't any work, uh, uh, I believe this was nevertheless in some ways a tender, nice time for my father to appreciate his daughter, his wife. Many Lithuanian high schools were established there with uh, the many refugees. And my father spent some of the time serving as basketball coach. I didn't really know that until late in my life, seeing, finding old pictures. But it turned out that without any prompting or coaching from him, basketball has been a, an important part of my own life, and I play to this day. In 1949, it was time for Porvilus Scudigius and his little family to go to the United States. They went on a large ship out of the port of Hamburg, and after a long crossing of the Atlantic, they got to the Statue of Liberty, which was a very, I think, emotional view for my father. Once in New York, they very briefly met with an old photography buddy of his from, from Lithuania who loaned them five dollars. They had twenty-some dollars from Catholic Relief Agency to go by train to Cleveland. Well, why Cleveland? Well, Cleveland is where the First Lady of Lithuania was. She was my godmother. She was just the person with whom my father showed the greatest happiness because that was a reuniting with his glory days. But, of course, it wasn't all glory days then. He was a refugee in the United States and, of course, penniless. Uh, and uh, he had to get a job and he managed to get a job in a factory. Footbird factory, which had factories, I guess, in branches in other cities as well. And it was a dark, different kind of, of life for this uh, rising political star from the inner circle of the president of independent Lithuania, a guy who was a month from his bar exam, uh, was considered himself versed in all classic literature of the world. He was able to sweep the floors at this uh, factory. And of course, having the job was, was golden because uh, when there was a recession in 2000, I mean in uh, 1957, 58, 59, he was without work, eventually went back to work in another factory briefly, but uh, during that time he was just kind of begging for odd jobs. I remember in the summers he would, I would uh, walk several miles with him to uh, the home of a Lithuanian physician, 
for whom my father did some yard work. And uh, a few miles, a mile or so further, we would go and I would help him to do odd jobs at the home of uh, a couple of uh, rich people, an industrialist and his wife, who were part sponsors together with my godmother for uh, my family's stay in, Lith in, uh, in the United States. But that recession faded, and he did eventually get back to Footbird Factory, and uh, he rose in the ranks and eventually became what was called an assembler of these large modules, machinery that constituted assembly lines in car factories in Detroit and aluminum can factories. So that's what my father did, and he was he was proud of of that work. He he uh, he eventually became even a consultant that the company sent around in his last years of work before retirement, at age sixty two, and. Uh, but it, he worked hard. He he worked overtime all the time. He he worked two hours extra every day. So he had ten hour days for most of the time that I knew this fella, my father. And he was glad to get us into a middle class status. My mother also worked as a nurse. And uh, but it wore on him. His body was quite broken down by his fifties. And it was, I think, broken down in part of because of so much else that was that he wasn't in touch with that was going on elsewhere in the world. You got to remember that he was in Germany and in the United States when many other things happened. This is a, a slide of the funeral of his younger brother Jozas, who was a partisan fighter, who stayed and fought the Russians. Uh, my father didn't, of course, and how, of course, uh, would he feel, Would he? did he feel, for not having stayed and fought. Uh, but, of course, he didn't even know about this, um, the death of his, his brother in 1947, until we started to finally get some letters from the closed Iron Curtain, from the closed Soviet Union. And this was in the in the 50s, in the sort of middle 50s, that we started to get letters like this that were already opened and highly censored and places where parts were cut out and so forth. So very careful letters without any political views were sent finally from our relatives to us in the United States. And they told of some things like the 1956 death of his father, my father was proud of the news that he got that my father rode his horse up until the day he died. But he died at 78, not, not very old. And um, he also had to live through that war. Uh, his farm had been taken away by the collectivization, the clustering of farms that was uh, the Soviet way. And, of course, there was a big family there. And we got photos like this, finally. And I think it would have been hard on my father to see what he missed. That he wasn't there to stand by his mother. There was a whole family life that was going on that he was not part of. Well... Uh, the Soviet Union was very closed, but eventually some travel to the Soviet Union was possible, although it was highly regimented. KGB people, the uh, Secret Service, would be watching uh, each of the people that came. And, of course, there was no possibility of my father going back because he was an enemy of the state. But in 1972, my the, uh, travel was allowed, and my mother and my sister did go back, but not my father. I wonder what he felt with them going back, and he had to stay home. He had to stay back in the United States. In 1978, his mother 
passed away. We got some photos like these. Look at this big community of people that he was completely separated from. His brothers, his sisters, his other relatives. He wasn't able to be at his mother's funeral. Here they are taking the, the casket from the home where he was born, where he was raised. And taking it through the streets of Utena to the church where the funeral services were held. There was a lot that he was separated from, and I think that separation was painful. But coming back to the United States, I want to tell you that there were there were nice things. There were there were good things that went on, things that gave him some joy. Here's one. In the factory that he uh, worked at Footbert, he was really uh, quite the the uh, outcast because there was a lot of prejudice against the displaced persons, as they were called, because workers in factories like that had uh, felt some jealousy and worried about their jobs going to these new people, these uh, refugees. Well, the person he made friends with was a, a fellow named Pancho from Central America, and Pancho turned him on to baseball. And uh, Pancho and my father and I would go to baseball games, the Cleveland Indian games, and we got to know it well. He would, my father would listen to all the games, sometimes with me on the radio, and we went to a lot of, a lot of Cleveland Indian games. It was a source of joy. My father was also uh, big into chess, very good chess player, and into cards. Here he's playing with my sister and myself, but he would play uh, high-level uh, cards like bridge and another uh, game called preference, preferences, uh, a game apparently more popular in Europe. And he would play in, in long night uh, sessions with the First Lady, Mrs. Smetona, my godmother, and other of, other of his friends. Uh, much later, uh, he, found, uh, he found someone with his similar competitive spirit to play cards and chess with. It was my friend James here in Santa Fe. And he nicknamed uh, uh, James Mr. Games. But in fact, I think that uh, my father was the original Mr. Games. He enjoyed cards and games and baseball and sports very, very much. And there were other joys. We traveled. We had a kind of a semblance of a normal middle class life. Here we were traveling to Florida, other times to Cape Cod, and other destinations in the United States. There was a a kind of an active social life that he had in the Lithuanian community. There were many evening events and and uh, and and dances and and special commemorations and a lot of things happening. And then we had a lot of uh, of a social life with with various families that we were closer with. Here we are getting together with uh, two other families for Easter in 1960. My father got some joy, I think, from from my play of tennis. Uh, he never told me uh, uh, until much, much later that uh, he had actually been a fairly good tennis player in Lithuania. He had played against the Lithuanian champion. Uh, and the um, Lithuanian champion also had a, a son like myself who was, came three years after me uh, and uh, became uh, third ranked in the United States. But my father uh, watched and never said much, never coached me really. Uh, decades later he told me, uh, you know, you were a good athlete, which is a, a big piece of praise from coming from him. He says, but he said, you just never had the killer instinct. So anyway, he took some joy in, in the fact of, that I had a, a few achievements in, in tennis. Of course, my father took great pride in his grandchildren. Here he is with my sister's firstborn, Rima. Uh, 
Then there was her son, Alex. And then there was my daughter, Blue Jay. And then my son, Jonas Povilas. So there were many wonderful things in the life that he had made in the United States. There was really great joy, uh, a wonderful family. Here he is uh, with my son, uh, and a cap that my son is wearing is of the Cavs or Cavaliers, and they're a basketball franchise in Cleveland, and uh, they started in 1979, and my father became a fan, and and uh, just another example of uh, some of his interests, some of the things that, that uh, gave him enjoyment. Uh, of course, just like anybody else, uh, he had some health problems. Uh, he retired at age 62 and a half, and uh, there were some shocking kind of problems. His, some of his teeth fell out, and, and he sort of recovered himself by playing golf and that was another whole saga and story he had a terrible swing to my eye but he enjoyed it so much got some holes in one and played on a Lithuanian team that would travel to other Lithuanian cities like Detroit and Chicago for tournaments he had some guys to hang out with and and uh, something to play regularly most of the year and that made a lot of difference and kind of perked up his health but here here he is in the Cleveland Clinic I'm visiting him after he had some emergency surgery for a heavily enlarged aorta. The aorta is a, the largest blood vessel in the body. It's deep, deep inside the abdomen. And his was enlarged to a point of, of beginning to tear. And he had emergency surgery. He had a, a repeat surgery two days after because something didn't go right. And then I think he had yet one more surgery later on. So this was a, a kind of a pinnacle health crisis that he had. Uh, my mother uh, told his admitting physician, who was my one of Dr. Yodianas, who was one of my uh, inspirations, a family physician, our, our family physician, uh, and she, she told him, Oh, can't you get Porvilus off of cigarettes? See, my father had smoked all of his life right up to that time. And he even had a carton of cigarettes in the, in the hospital room. So my, my doctor, Edmund Yodianas, who had been my father's roommate in high school, all through high school, and his close friend, and had been continuing as a friend all these years, all these decades, went in there and said, and it kind of nervously, I think, uh, Povilas, you have to stop smoking now. My father uh, threw the <laughs> carton of cigarettes in the wastebasket and never smoked again. Uh, uh, my father was, uh, that was, you know, my his one big vice. Alcohol was not a big vice of, of this man. He used to have one to two beers a day. Uh, and would occasionally drink just a little bit more in a social situation. But he only got drunk one time that we know of. And we remember, I was young, my my sister and, and mother and I all kind of laughed and chuckled as he threw up into the toilet at home. And I think he just, you know, he he never, to our knowledge, got drunk other than that one time. My mother also took opportunity here to uh, push him on, on diet. He was always the big meat eater, eating fat and meat. And that's what built up in the inside of his aorta to make it burst. So she used that little leverage and got him eating brown rice and vegetables on a regular basis. So who was this man, Povilus Skurgis? What made him tick? What was most important to him? I believe that politics, Lithuanian nationhood, and the flow of history were pivotal for this fella. Yes, he had a, a family, a job, friends, and a community in Cleveland, Ohio. However, it, his life, its highs and, and lows, it, its pivotal changes,
were like so, so tied to the tides of political history. History, nationalism, and politics were key to his spirit as well as to his deepest disappointments. Uh, this is a, a photo from a 25-year commemoration of the death of President Smetona. Technically, my father was a Christian Democrat, a conservative. There was a, a social arm of this party called the Ateteninkai, and all of us were active as Ateteninkai, and he chaired the organization for one or two terms. But he made a point of distancing himself from the Fronteninkai party, which is now being criticized by historians in Lithuania as having been too cozy with the Germans. And President Smetona was of a different party, the Toteninkai party. They had a platform uh, that one's nation was the highest ideal. The Christian Democrats' platform was God first and nation second. On multiple occasions, my father repeated that stance to me. However, emotionally, I'm convinced that my father's heart was most stirred by idealized action for his nation. He told me directly that service to one's nation was the highest expression possible for a human in this world. Whether it was politics or religion, Porvilus Scardus, or, or Scardus as he changed his name to, uh, coming into the United States, was a man of strong principles, strong ideals. Maybe in some way he was uh, forever bothered by a feeling that he was not adequately able to help his country or his relatives back in Lithuania. Maybe such failures led him to be over strict in many of his later positions on religious, morals, and politics. In American politics, he was a staunch Republican anti-communist hawk, and he and I clashed over the Vietnam War. My sister also had friction with him to the end regarding some of his staunch positions. However, I think in his later years, he did mellow in some ways. My wife, Celeste, remembers him as accepting and kind to her, especially in his later years. So, since politics and history were so pivotal and crucial in the life of this man, let's recap some of world history from 1979. At that time, we were in the depths of what was called Cold War. The U.S. and its allies in what was called the West were in a standoff with the USSR and its allies in Eastern Europe and some other communist countries in Asia. It was so entrenched, so kind of institutionalized that this Cold War standoff was that I honestly never thought it would change. I really didn't. Of course, I think this was probably deeply discouraging to my father. But some things started to happen in 1979. The Pope uh, was elected as Pope John Paul, Pope Johannes Povilas, and he was from Poland. In fact, he was, he was part Lithuanian. And in 1979, he... he was able somehow to arrange to visit uh, Poland. And here he is, speaking to millions and millions of, of Poles. Well, off of that, emboldened by th this visit of the Pope to this Roman Catholic country in 1980, uh, there were some strikes in a big shipyard and the emergence of, a, of a, a movement called Solidarity. It was a movement, and it was also literally a union. And eventually this union, over the next nine years, got all the way to becoming in power and getting, getting their leader, this shipyard worker, Lech Walesa, elected as president of Poland. Of course, Poland uh, was a, an independent country, even though they were very 
influenced by the Soviet Union, and they were their own country, and and the, and this was not. Uh, there were still communists in this government to some extent, but uh, this was a, 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 a major break in the chokehold of the communist influence in Eastern Europe. Well, the next thing that happened, the next important consideration was uh, with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. After Stalin, Khrushchev, and some others, Mikhail Gorbachev became head of the Soviet Union in 1985. Perhaps in part because of pressure from within his communist world, he developed principles of perestroika, which meant restructuring of the, Uni of the USSR, some kind of restructuring that many people were yearning for, and of glasnost, which meant openness to other ideas and even openness to the West. And he also looked for a very limited type of democratization, Uh, and, you know, he, this, this was a major development within the USSR. So Gorbachev became more friendly with people like my father's hero, Ronald Reagan. And then, because of this, coming off of this, in 1987, uh, a group of Lithuanians got together. Uh, some were communists, some were uh, uh, Catholics, some were... Uh, many were artists. I think a lot of the, some of the best people in, in Lithuania and parts of the Soviet Union uh, fleed to the arts as a, as a safe haven because they couldn't be who they wanted to be in politics and government. And so they were artists. Well, this small group of people uh, in 1987 uh, called themselves... Uh, solidarity and uh, they were more like the beginning initiative for a group called solidarity as they not solidarity but Sayudis, the movement and and they um, they got together and they started to have some some uh, demonstrations kind of gatherings all peaceful they're all committed to peaceful action and uh, the, the, the demonstrations, the gatherings, attracted more people than they expected. And in 1988, they formally became Sayudis, an organization that had the goals officially, which kind of, I think, uh, gave them the permission to, to, be, to exist, of promoting glasnost and perestroika, which were principles that were officially uh, sanctioned, that were allowed. Uh, and they had even bigger demonstrations in 1988. And they started to clearly become demonstrations for freedom of Lithuania. And, and emboldened by the large amount of, of people who were supporting them and by the lack of repression of their efforts, in 1989 their demonstrations reached to the extent of, of having 250,000 people, which was one out of every uh, eight Lithuanians attending. Well, this was obviously a very different time. Some, some many things were changing. My, my father, I think, had his heart racing with uh, hope of what was happening in Poland first, and then in the Soviet Union with Gorbachev, and then in Lithuania with these amazing demonstrations that were not crushed and repressed. My father felt that it was a time that he could finally go back there. And he did. He visited in 1989. Here he is meeting his brothers. a very special time, a completion, an important date in my father's life. <laughs> 
but he had a life in 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 the United States and he went back he had family and he continued to watch on the television and in the news with other developments that trip to Lithuania of his was in the summer and then in November of 1989 with a lot of prompting from Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher from from Britain uh, uh, the Berlin Wall came down. Now, this was just a, literally a wall between West and East Berlin, but it meant more than that. It was symbolic, and it was meaningful, and it was all about the closing off of the Soviet Union, and you knew that when it came down, that w the, the days were numbered for East Germany and, and, and much of the communist world. So here it was, an amazing time. And then in Lithuania... Latvia and Estonia, the three Baltic countries, there was a human chain to uh, highlight or, or demonstrate the unity of these countries and their wish to be free and independent. Two million people lined up on the highways and spanned hand to hand between the three countries' capitals. And then more demonstrations happened in Lithuania. Imagine my father watching all this. And they culminated in, well, there was an important other step and as all of this effort was happening and so much of, of a show of, of, uh, of, of sentiment in, the, in Lithuania was, was occurring, uh, the Lithuanian Communist Party uh, uh, separated themselves from the, from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And that was an important step. And then all of that culminated on this date. There were elections called, elections held, and the people from Sayudis carried the day. They got a firm, large majority in the governing body, the, the, the Supreme Soviet, the... the uh, the parliament-like structure in Lithuania and their first action declare independence they reinstated the constitution from this, the Smetona era of independence between the two world wars at least symbolically at least at first there were other changes that brought it back to uh, similar governance method that was there in the, the Soviet era, but the leaders that were elected were the Sayadis Lithuanian pro-independence members, and they elected a president who was from Sayadis, the leader of Sayadis. This was, imagine, uh, such an event for my father. Just his heart, I think, pounding out of his chest. But it was tested. On this day uh, in 1991, uh, the Soviets tried to take back Lithuania. They, the tanks rolled in. But Lithuanians uh, tried to preserve uh, their independence. The, the, the tanks went up against the TV tower that was just a block away from... Uh, my cousin's apartment in Vilnius. And Lithuanians, including uh, some of my cousins, uh, went to non-violently try to stop the tanks. And it became Bloody Sunday, 14... Uh, were killed, a thousand injured. Barricades were were put up around the parliament building to try and and stop the tanks from coming to uh, the parliament, and the parliament just held up twenty four seven in the parliament building to maintain power there and many hundreds of thousands of, of people came as a human barricade. 
So many died, many were injured. It was a terrible, tense time. But with world opinion, the, the Russian tanks pulled back and the Sayudis government held. So let's go back to my father's life in the United States, in Cleveland, Ohio. From 91 to 92, he, you know, had some assurance that uh, Lithuania was holding its own, that, it, it, that a big uh, threat to them from Russian tanks was repulsed. And he continued to play golf. His health wasn't, wasn't perfect. He was 80 years old. And uh, we had a, a nice event in the summer of, of 1992. It was uh, the 50th anniversary of my parents' marriage. We had a family get-together in Monterey and Carmel, California. It was a wonderful time. My father had a great deal to be proud of, and he was indeed very happy with his family and his life. And on top of it, Lithuania was free and independent. And then uh, he continued again playing golf to the degree he could and living a family life. And then came another major event. Elections had to be held again. And in Lithuania. And the results came on October 25th, 1992. I don't know when he actually found out the news. This was before the time of the internet. And, uh, you know, newspapers were not uh, that detailed on Lithuanian elections. He tried to listen on world band radio, shortwave radio. So I don't know if it was then on October 25th or a few days after that it sunk in that in those elections the immature Lithuanian electorate that had only uh, hadn't previously had elections since the 1930s had flip-flopped and they had gone against their first voting for Syedis and had re-elected the communists into power. Well, this was, I think, very crushing to my father. Said uh, another way, the communists again took over Lithuania. Maybe the effects of trauma may never go away for some people. Maybe they're just like buried ready to be reawakened with the right trigger. Well, I believe that after the roller coasters of older history and then recent history regarding Lithuania, the ups and downs, the big ups and downs, for Porvila Skardis, this stunning re-election of communists in 1992 Lithuania uh, was probably a reactivation of deep lifelong disappointment that had turned the, the rising star, the young man in rising independent Lithuania into a homeless refugee and then a factory sweeper in a far off land almost entirely separated from his relatives hopes and his dreams. I think it was devastating. I think it broke his heart. On November 6th, just, you know, 10, 10 days after that election, uh, my father was cutting the lawn, uh, mowing the lawn in this nice middle-class house that he had worked his way up to. My mother was uh, away shopping, and he collapsed and died. Uh, the eventual stated cause of his death was complete cardiac arrest. 
I think he had a broken heart. We had our funeral here and back in Utena, Lithuania. He, an empty casket was paraded through the, the city streets to the church where he grew up and funeral, a parallel funeral was held for him in Lithuania. My sister in the middle there was, happened to have been in Lithuania at the time and she participated in that funeral while we had ours here. He was uh, buried in Cleveland, Ohio. 20 years ago. My father died. Twenty years ago, he would have been a hundred had he lived. <laughs> 